Welcome everybody to the June 2023 novice meeting of the Houston Astronomical Society. Uh, my name is Joe Caleb. I'm the president of HAS. And uh, with us tonight, we've got Chris Morissette, who is our novice chairperson. And not, uh, Chris is going to go ahead and introduce tonight's guest speaker. So Chris, go ahead and uh, take it away. Sounds great, Joe. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, excellent. So uh, tonight we have uh, Craig Lamison. Uh, he's going to describe the uh, observing uh, or Astronomical League observing programs and how you can participate in them. Uh, he'll also describe the required and optional observing programs you must complete in order to gain the title of Master Observer. Um, a little bit about Craig. He, uh, as a member of HAS, he's been a member of HAS since 2013. Uh, Craig is a retired subsea and pipeline engineer, uh, an evening star party run by the Austin Astronomical Society inspired him to see what Houston had to offer. He was excited to find HAS had a dark side at which the Milky Way is visible. Um, that had never been true anywhere he had lived before, and he was further hooked and introduced to uh, ob observation logging. Uh, by the X, uh, TX-45 list developed by uh, Rene Gadeli. Uh, his current somewhat long-term astronomical goal is to complete the Astronomical League's Master Observer Program. So uh, with that introduction, uh, Craig, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let you uh, tell us all about uh, the Astronomical League Observing Program. Well, thank you, Chris. Where to begin? Well, I'm gonna start with uh, some initial basic facts that many of you in the HAS already know. What are we talking about here? I'm gonna move on to why should it matter to you? And then we're going to get into the how, where to begin, some general tips that apply to the whole realm of programs from the Astronomical League. And then we'll touch on a few of the programs I'm familiar with, by no means uh, a long list. Well, why me? Well, I volunteered. I am pursuing a number of Astronomical League programs, but I am not a master observer or even the first category, an observer. However, I'm on the way, and I hope that this presentation uh, inspires others to uh, adopt my enthusiasm. Who else do we have in the club? We have quite a number of master observers. If you know one, they're always happy to answer questions. And uh, if you want, you can also crowdsource answers from the email list. Getting to the basics, what is the Astronomical League? Simply, it is a league of astronomy societies, clubs, and associations. Houston Astronomical Society is one of those. If you are a member of the Houston Astronomical Society, you are a member of the Astronomical League. The league has developed a number of observing programs and a progression of these programs, which help the person doing the programs move through them in an organized fashion. Well, what is a program? There are over 75 observing programs. And those programs generally have a number of features. They're a set of observation targets and activities. They're structured to promote interest in and knowledge of a topic, an astronomical to topic. They're refereed, if you want, to verify your completion and competence on that topic. Now, let me point out here, you don't have to get a certificate or pins to enjoy these programs, and they're still valuable. Some people do, some people don't. It's up to you. Then they've organized the programs into a set representing increasing expertise. The wide breadth of our hobby, which we will see is quite wide. Sometimes there are hobbies within the hobby and recognize those who are taking on the challenges. 
why or what's in it for you? These programs generally assemble the best and brightest targets in a category. The people that have assembled these programs and lists of targets are experts in the field. They've probably observed thousands of them and picked, say, the 100 best. The targets extend from the solar system, the sun, out to billions of light years. We said breadth, they cover visual, imaging, outreach, and scientific contributions. They cover all ranges of ages and skills, starting at under 10, and even up to ages, advanced ages like mine. They're designed to improve your skills as you move through and your knowledge of the topic, and they provide an organized development path. If you're a beginner, you may not want to start with the spectroscopy uh, program. The Galilean Club, though, is good for everybody. My organized path, they've actually built flow charts to direct you through them. You got goals? Well, here they are ready-made for you. Well, where to begin? The Astro League, like most organizations, has a website. And on this website, indeed, we have a uh, flowchart which you can follow. Uh, part of my screen is a little blocked here. I hope that's not for everybody else. But you start at the upper left-hand corner, new to observing and wondering where to begin. Well, if you just move on. If it's no, there's other observing programs for that. We'll get there in a moment. If you're under age 10, you can move to the Sky Puppy Observing Program and then on through the Youth Astronomy Astronomer Program. If you are under age 17, that's the best place to start. Now you can do those programs even if you're not those age groups, but you can't get certified in that area. If you're older, this is where they recommend starting. I would say one of the two constellation hunter programs, either the Northern Hemisphere, probably true for most of my listeners, or the Southern Hemisphere, for those who are generally south of the equator. The Constellation Hunter is a foundation program. The constellations essentially are a map of the skies. If you want to know where Houston is, it's good to know that it is in the Northern Hemisphere in the state of Texas. If you want to know where Betelgeuse is, it's good to know it's in the Northern Hemisphere in the constellation of Orion. Another program, which also is eyes only, like these two, is the Beyond Polaris Observing Program. You need no equipment. You can start here, no excuses. However, you can move on, staying eyes only, if you wish, using binoculars, if you have some binoculars, or choosing one of these entry-level programs. If you're not a beginner, well, the place to start is one of these programs. This is the progression, which we'll talk about in a moment. But there are two other programs which are standalones. The Binocular Master Observer Program, not surprisingly, requires you to use binoculars. And the Master Imager Award, which requires considerably more expensive equipment. Uh, our club has many experts in that area. I'm not one of them. So we'll touch only briefly on these. The binoculars, it's fairly simple. You've got a choice of eight out of these 10 particular observing programs. They're fairly straightforward. You can start them with 10 by 50 binoculars from Walmart. Uh, some of the more advanced ones, it would be helpful to have larger binoculars and have them mounted on a tripod or parallelogram mount. If you're into imaging, there is the Master Imager Award. And this works somewhat different than the binocular uh, award in that 
you have short lists from which you must pick some particular programs to work from. Lunar, one of three. Solar, one of two. Solar system main bodies, such as the moon, uh, sorry, Mars or Jupiter, one of three. Any one of 10 deep space object observing programs Many imagers probably have those already in the, in the can. And scientific studies, one of four. This is somewhat unique to the imaging program in that professional astronomy these days is done photographically. And these programs actually are taken from that type of, of uh, academic studies. Then you get to pick five other observing programs done through imaging. The Astronomical League website also has, in addition to those flow charts, more details on each program. For each individual certificate, they give you the mandatory programs you must do, any predecessor certificates you must hold, self-selected programs you can uh, pick from, and the objective, for example, in this case, a starting point for the observer program and a foundation for further studies. Now they hold your hand here at the beginning pretty much. For instance, mandatory programs, you have to do these four. You only get to pick one, and it's from a short list of eight. <clears throat> so this particular study gets you started, <clears throat> excuse me, on the basics. Constellation Hunter, which we mentioned, Messier programs, or again, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the Bennett program, a lunar program and the solar system program. You also then get to pick one from a short list of eight. I'll point out here, we'll discuss this a little bit later, but one of these is the Universe Sampler program by HAS Master Observer, Amelia Goldberg. Then you can move on to Master Observer if you wish, but you're also allowed to start here. And you now can see that some of the programs you might have done as an observer would still apply. So you get kind of two birds with one stone there. In addition, there's a couple other programs that are added to the mandatory list. And now you get to pick five more from remaining lists. Note, neither of these programs have any predecessors. Moving on from the master observer to much more rarefied uh, observing, you have the advanced observer certificate. No mandatory programs in this, but you must have completed both the observer award and the master observer award. You must also join the master observers network. This is a resource for people in the Astronomical League to ask questions about observing. You then are expanding your knowledge and uh, uh, knowledge of astronomical objects and types. And uh, you can continue then on to the master observer silver level. Again, we have some mandatory programs you must have completed the Advanced Observer Award. And I will point out one difference here. At this point, they no longer allow you to double dip. You must complete 20 separate programs uh, to, to match this award. And you, you don't have to end there. You can keep moving on. I suggest that you should be younger than I am if you want to get up to this level. That's a lot of observing. Well, let's talk about some universal methodologies that apply to all the programs generally. First, log your observations. You can log your observations freehand. You can log your observations using a list provided by the Astronomical League in a, in a spiral bound notebook. Why? Well, I use some observations made prior to starting the Astronomical League programs. And I also 
dearly wish that I had made logs of some of the first observations I made back in the early 1970s when I put together a telescope from some online optics, a four inch mirror I bought on Jaggers, parts from Edmund Scientific and some eyepieces, pipe from my local hardware store and uh, wood. Now, why? Because it's 50 years later and I really wish I knew what I could see then with eyes that were 50 years younger than mine are today. You also have other methods of recording. Voice recording, such as that done by Stephen Jones, if you've talked to him. Later, he transcribes that into a written record. Or you can type the information directly into a database if that is your uh, preferred means of doing it. Be aware if it's the dark site, the screen needs to be suitably shielded. You also need to record certain data all the time. Date and time and location are fundamental. You need to have location sufficient to be able to get the latitude and longitude for your site. I generally just keep a table of all the places I've observed with the latitude and longitude and then have a short form like HAS, which means the dark site on my log. You don't want to spend all your observing time writing down latitude and longitude. These matter because what you see depends on where you are, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and the date and time. Is it the time of year when the constellation you're looking at is in the sun, the age of Aquarius? Or is it the time of night? where you are observing, but the object you want to see hasn't risen yet. This is also important in how high the object is in the sky, and thus how much transparency you have to view it. Seeing and transparency are two criteria, how much the stars twinkle, and how faint a star can you see from your sight. And those also reflect on what you're gonna be able to detect. Equipment, of course, we know that. The size of your scope matters. And finally, they don't just want you to check it off your list. Make some notes, make a sketch. Doesn't have to be elaborate. Perhaps you say oblong, small, fuzzy bar. Many of mine have a lot of that particularly if it's a faint fuzzy. Now, the AL program and website does have further guides to help you to select objects based on whether you're a beginner, what type of optics you have, and other factors. They have an observing program selector grid. This grid will help you determine, is it urban suitable? Is a dark site needed? Equipment categories, what are you looking through or with? Are you doing astrophotography or other factors? Is it manual, go-to, or visual? As we'll see, some restrictions do apply for those particular methods. Now, this guy is a PDF on the website. And I found, okay, I wanna look at beginner programs. Well, you have to go down and find an X for each one and then write them down on a separate sheet. You can't sort a PDF. So I went ahead and created a spreadsheet. This was based on one you can get from Dr. Aaron Clevenson's spreadsheet, What's Up Doc? And we'll talk about where that can be found later. I have posted this on the Facebook novice group, so it is available. What other planning resources do we have? The AL website has information on each program. There's enough of them that they have been categorized alphabetically. We mentioned Dr. Aaron Clevenson's Inspirity Humble ISD Observatory, What's Up Doc? That's this website. The home screen looks like this. And it does have a spreadsheet, which allows you to find what is up 
tonight. The spreadsheet version can be downloaded, which is how I created the other spreadsheet. For example, you can also cross log and make your observing more efficient. This is part of planning your observations, another important thing to do for if you're pursuing these programs. M38, which is an uh, open cluster in Oregon, is an example. It is on the Herschel list, the binocular Messier list, the Messier list, the open cluster list, the urban list, and the sketching list. And these are just the ones I know about out of those 75. You can progress multiple programs with fewer observations, but you need to be sure you meet the requirements of the various programs, which may not be compatible. Example, for the binocular messiers, you've got to be using binoculars. A telescope may be required for faint fuzzies in urban environments. The messier program cannot use GoTo, which also can be a stumbling block if you're me particularly from an urban environment. The dark site's a different, different story. The Messier observations must be visual. Uh, astrophotography is not allowed here. The open cluster requirements require you estimate the Trump word ca category, and we will go into that in a bit more detail later. And the urban program can't be done anywhere the Milky Way is visible. Now, in theory, to count for all six programs, you're going to have to observe and sketch them from the backyard, both with binoculars and a telescope, which may be challenging to find with binoculars. I used a C8 go-to telescope to make this sketch of uh, M7, which is a very bright open cluster in the Sagittarius Scorpius region, I did estimate the Trumpler. It would be a wild astronomical guess. And it was, I got Roman numeral one, number one R, when it is generally accepted to be Roman numeral two, Arabic numeral two and R. And we'll go into that a bit more in later detail. You also, need to be recording information on the cardinal directions for the sketching program. This is done by observing drift with tracking turned off if you're using a tracking scope or just which way do the stars go out of your eyepiece with a manual scope like my Dob. From the number of mirrors in that telescope, you can determine where north is and get those two directions. The Herschel program suggests you use a 10 inch or more, uh, but eight inches close enough. Thus, this observation could be used for urban open cluster sketching in Herschel, but I missed the binocular and I can't use it for the Messier because I was using go to. Here we'll take a non-comprehensive look at some programs. You could probably spend 10 minutes on each one and we don't have that. I'm running long as it is. We'll put them in three useful categories to start out at the observer level. What are some of the programs? What about urban? If you can't get out to the dark site or you need to get to bed at a reasonable time to get up for work the next day. And finally, deep star sky observations. This will make use of one of the most valuable parts of your HAS membership, and that is our dark sky site. The other, of course, is the people in the club. Starting out, the observer level. Well, as we mentioned, you have to do five programs. Several of these are mandatory, and two of them that I've selected here are in the eight that you can select the final program from. I will give a brief overview of each program, why it's suggested, and some tips, if any. For example, for the constellation program, 
Here is my first constellation observation. It was done for the Texas 45. It is the constellation Delphinius, the dolphin, shown here as a sketch of five stars. Not too difficult, you can do it. It is jumping out of the water to join Cygnus, the swan, and Aquila, the eagle, in the sky. Moving on to some of those other ones, we mentioned the Universe Sampler Program. As we said, created by Master Observer Amelia Goldberg of HAS. It is excellent for learning your way around the sky, and it shows you what's out there and more. It contains planets, the moon, galaxies, open clusters, double stars, and comets. Another program, this one suggested by Dr. Aaron Clevenson, is the Galileo program. This one allows you to retrace world rocking history, such as this observation. There were two theories of the universe in Galileo's time. The accepted theory was that everything rotated around the Earth and astronomical bodies such as the moon and the sun were perfectly smooth spheres, among other criteria. There was also the heretical Copernican theory where things rotated or revolved around the sun, not the earth. And that one could get you in trouble. But here's Galileo. He's looking at Jupiter. He sees a line of small stars stretched out across Jupiter. And he notices they change position every night. Thus, the sky is not unchanging. And an explanation for this is these are moons of Jupiter going around Jupiter, not just the Earth. He also looked at Saturn. He saw ears. Ears, that's not a perfectly smooth sphere. He saw there were more things out here, there than you could see with the naked eye. The Seven Sisters, well, this is a lot more than seven stars in the Pleiades. <laughs> My sketch was not nearly so good as Galileo's. And it uses basic equipment. You still have it better than Galileo, even if you have a two and a half inch department store telescope that cost a hundred bucks. He had to make his own and they were no bigger. Well, to start out with some of those mandatory programs, what about the solar system? Binoculars or a telescope can be used, or both. You can actually get two certificates by, by using binoculars. Same for the lunar program. Light pollution is not an issue. And this, for example, is one of those areas where I had documentation from way before when I started the Astronomical League programs. I was the faculty advisor for this program. The primary investigator was my daughter in third grade. We had visited Stonehenge. Our theory was, was Stonehenge actually engineered? Or was it an accident? Well, could we redo observations that would demonstrate that 5,000 years ago, people could obviously figure this out? She went and made observations using a very simple piece of equipment, which was a clipboard with a hole in it, a revolving pointer, a piece of paper, which you lined up with north and took off the angular measurement. She went out regularly every week to a site where we had a clear eastern horizon and took those measurements. And I was able to plot those and answer questions which are part of the solar system. Uh, the, actually, the first, the sun, targets for the solar system program. Lunar observations, they're simple to make. That was a sketch I made for those. The Messier programs, for instance, here again with binoculars, I saw from the dark site using 20 by 80s that cost me less than $200. In fact, 
only a little over 100, as I recall. They were seconds from the Ryan telescopes. Uh, three Messier objects, 95, 96, and 105 in one field of view. Okay, what about urban observing? Well, there are two in particular, sunspotters, which <laughs> you're looking at sunspots, and the hydrogen alpha uh, program, which I both find, I find both interesting. This is a good year for solar observing. Anywhere in Texas, you're gonna have two opportunities, the weather being cooperating to see a partial solar eclipse. If you get on the center line, as you probably heard from uh, Debbie Moran's presentation, I think last month, you will be able to see a case where you have the ring of fire solar eclipse. This is still a partial eclipse where the moon is further from the earth and smaller and or the sun is nearer in the earth's orbit and larger and the moon doesn't quite cover the sun. Later, next April, you'll be a, able to see an eclipse on the center line or near where just the opposite occurs. The moon is now near and or the sun further and it just covers the moon. You will be able to see the solar corona. You won't need uh, optical filters as long as it's during totality. You will even be able to see things like this uh, solar prominence, which otherwise you can only see using hydrogen alpha telescopes. Now note, there's another reason this is a good year, and that is we are approaching or in solar maximum, which means there are more sunspots, more prominences, and other things to observe on the sun. Lunar, well, definitely not a problem for light pollution. This photo was taken by a friend of mine in Singapore, where the light pollution is worse, if you can believe it, than Houston. The solar system, well, that was Mars using a big telescope from the dark side. What about urban observing? The Milky Way must not be visible. So that is a major criteria. They recommend as a result because of light pollution and faint fuzzies, a six to 10 inch aperture scope. I'm using eight inch. I'm not sure this will be enough. Michael Rapp, tells me that he has seen some of the faint objects with a 12 inch daub. He recommends a nine by 50 uh, right angle correct image finder and the pocket sky atlas, which corresponds well with the stars you can see in such a finder to star hop to these objects. So that's on my to-do list, but we'll see if I can manage it. Finally, Obstruction horizon and lights can be a problem. Here is again M7. It was in the trees when I saw it with the eight inch SCT and made a sketch. I could still detect it, but light pollution and light shining in your eyes is always a problem in urban locations. In this case, I was looking at Jupiter. I was trying to see an occultation happening there with one of the moons. I started in the backyard. My backyard is back here in the trees. Uh, it's surrounded by trees on all sides. I kept backing up as Jupiter set. It's right here now. I was already in the street. I ended up across the street under a street light before I finished that observation. Solar observing, we mentioned that briefly. Sunspotters, well, you need to use solar filters or a small refractor and a projection to see things like sunspots. The filter can be either over the objective, but not on the, uh, the eyepiece itself. If you've got one of those filters, throw them out, they'll heat up, they may crack, you're blind. Projection, again, is through, recommended through a small refractor because it can also heat up things along the optical path. You're concentrating the light. If I focus this image down, I could probably have burnt a hole in this piece of paper in a second. Thus, they don't recommend using it on multiple mirror telescopes, such as SCTs, 
you've got a lot of places heat can be trapped in that telescope. Another approach though is a Herschel wedge, again on a small refractor for the same reason. This wedge is essentially a prism located here. Most of the light just goes straight through. Only about 5% gets reflected up through special filters to the eyepiece. That light going straight, straight, straight through, sorry, ends up in a heat sink and it's ventilated to keep it cool. Hydrogen alpha, that requires a specialized scope. These scopes are filtered for a very narrow wavelength of solar light. They might not even see a blue uh, arc welder. There, nothing else comes through these telescopes. We're talking a solar hydrogen alpha filter, not one you would use for astrophotography or deep sky, which you do put on eyepieces. Well, deep sky, what about that? Double stars, open clusters, sketching, called the Caldwell program. We'll discuss all these, including the big kahuna, the Herschel 400. Double stars are traditionally an object of interest to amateur astronomers because back when I was growing up, many of the deep sky objects were not visible either due to your location with light pollution or due to your small optics. Small refractors were the rule. You do need simple sketches for this program. You need to see at least 50 out of 120 uh, uh, doubles. Five of these must be naked eye doubles. Now, a word there, if you can't see them all five of these 50, you need to see substitutes. I was only able to see three and two of those were with great difficulty. And so I had to, to do a minimum of 52 other observations. You can also use a telescope and do the telescopic program. You now need to see a hundred targets, however. You also need to determine the position angles. We'll have an example here uh, where I use Xi Scorpio, a double star, as uh, an example of determining position angles. You essentially need to know what direction does the line through the two double stars make with north in your eyepiece. To do that, you need to know where north is. You determine that by determining the drift, as we mentioned before. And also then using your telescope definition to, to tell where north is. I also make a sketch showing those factors and the directions I see in the stars, and then just measure it with a protractor. You can also use a reticle eyepiece, but I don't have one of those. Will Young says for a challenge, go ahead and estimate the separation between each double star. He does this by looking at a object of known size. You can look up, say, the diameter of Mars uh, and look at that in your eyepiece, memorize that, and then say, well, is the spacing twice Mars's diameter, one-tenth Mars diameter, or what? I haven't gotten to that stage yet. Now, many of these are also visible from urban areas, and small apertures are often enough. Large apertures, however, will show you more than two stars in quite a few cases. I saw six with a C14 at the dark site. I saw 12 with a 12-inch knob. You can see two easily with binoculars, and this is a naked eye star. Only a single one, but however, is visible. Few other targets have color. That's chiefly because your eyes do not have dark color receptors. They work in black and white for dim objects. What about the open cluster programs? I have Don Selly to thank for this beautiful photograph of the Pleiades. I hope you've forgotten my earlier sketch of those. The, uh, uh, sorry, the open cluster program requires you to observe 125 out of 215 
potential targets. These include both Northern and Southern Hemisphere targets. So it doesn't matter where you are on the Earth, this uh, certificate can be obtained. For the advanced certificate, which you need for the progression, you need to see at least, a sketch at least 50 of these. 25 will suffice for the other certificate. Now we also mentioned the Trumpler estimate you have to do. What is that? It's essentially a means of classifying this cluster or any class open cluster based on a number of factors. Let's use the Pleiades here and Don Selly's photograph as an example. You need to determine attachment and concentration of the cluster. Detachment means, is it separate from the background stars? Well, that's pretty obvious. I would say that most of us would agree this red circle shows where the cluster is, and we know it is not out here. What is the range? Uh, what is the amount of concentration? Well, again, you can see this, there are bright stars in the cluster down here, but it's obviously more concentrated here. So this is a concentrated cluster. Range of brightness, well, there are faint stars, though some are the background, and bright stars. The number of stars, well, you can count a whole bunch here. And that means this is actually a rich cluster. And does it have nebulosity? Also true. However, this was my third observation of the Pleiades for a, a logged observation. And I got Yes, Roman numeral one, which means it is detached and concentrated. Number three, wide range of brightness, got that one right too. I only counted, however, a couple dozen stars at the most. And less than 25 stars means it's a P poor cluster. M is medium cluster, R is rich cluster. This is indeed rich. And does it have nebulosity? I did see some, not nearly this much. So if you're going to get it wrong, why do it? It is a pretty subjective criteria. Well, the reason is this was my third observation. I had never noticed nebulosity before. If I had been looking because I needed to do classification, it could have been my sixth or seventh observation before I saw this. We also mentioned the Caldwell program. Well, in 1995, Sir Patrick Caldwell, Britain, Moore in Britain, proposed to Sky and Telescope mag magazine another program uh, or, or list of targets, the Caldwell list. <laughs> M was already taken by Messier. This captured many bright or not interesting non-Messier objects. There's a lot more than 109 or 110. It also was more comprehensive. Messier was looking from Paris, which is far north of Houston. This has things all over the sky in both the Northern and the Southern hemisphere. So you have to travel to see all of these and get the gold, but 70 out of 109 targets will get you a silver certificate, which is good enough, I think, for the progression. It includes very bright objects and very dark objects. Messier was looking for things that masqueraded as comets. The coal sack is not one of them. I have seen that from Hawaii. It is dark. And finally, as I said, the big kahuna, the Messier 400. That is a daunting number of targets to look for. Well, one hint given to me by Stephen Jones was do other deep sky programs first. You may find many duplicates. For instance, I'm doing the sketching program. Nearly 70% of those are also on the Herschel 400 list. Although since it's a much smaller program, you're not going to get 400 or anything, even 300 work. Likewise, the Caldwells, 64%, and 23% of planetaries are on that list too. And that was essentially what Stephen mentioned he found out when he started the Herschel list. Note I've put a few red asterisks as we're going along. Many of these can be done for the Master Imaging Award as well. 
Now note Herschel was using a big telescope, 40 feet long, 48 inch mirror. It was a metal mirror, had to be cleaned regularly because it corroded. But uh, that's why they were saying at least a 10 inch telescope. He pointed at the sky, it was cumbersome to move. He pointed at the meridian and watched things go over as I understand it and call out his observations to an assistant on the ground. I believe his sister was often that assistant. Finally, if you are interested in certificates, and we have many people who are easily capable of uh, documenting and showing that they're master observers in the club who haven't necessarily taken that route. If you want, however, Stephen Jones is our HAS liaison with the Astronomical League. And the procedure for a submission is generally to compile a log of your documentation per AL program requirements. Send it to Stephen for quick vetting with your contact details. Now notice, there are so certain things that you're not supposed to be doing. For instance, Messier objects. If you've done the, uh, for instance, Messier Marathon, those observations don't count. And in the past, liaisons have thrown them out if submission submitted. That is a checklist. You don't necessarily need to, to log the conditions under which you observed it or anything else. He, if he approves, passes it on to the AL coordinator for review and award. It will get a bit more scrutiny here. For instance, when I did the binocular observation program, he came back to me and I had a note that I observed difficult objects with a telescope to confirm my binocular observation. And he said, nope, no telescope is allowed for the binocular program. Now you may be using a telescope because some of those binocular Targets are also on the telescope list, but you can't say you confirmed your observation. You saw it or you didn't. Well, I have plenty of observations. I removed the half dozen that uh, had that note and he was quite happy with the final submission. Now, this has been a lot of material to cover in a short period of time. I didn't expect you to have time to take notes or a photographic memory to remember all that. There are some resources if you didn't. For instance, the Society has a YouTube channel at this address. Subscribe if you get a chance. They generally post these presentations online there. You can sign up for our email server list at info at astronomy.houston.org. And you can crowdsource an answer to your questions. If you're too bashful for that, feel free to send me an email. I will help if I can. Furthermore, I have posted these slides in PDF format on the Facebook uh, website for the club, the private server site. Look under units and the novice group, which would be this little cat's paw symbol showing a person and a group of people around them. And that's also where you'll find the spreadsheet I created if you want to sort by program requirements. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, our uh, organizers and uh, see if we have time for questions. Excellent. Um, so, Craig, thank you very much. Very informative presentation. Um, before I go to the chat, I've got... Um, a question for you. Is there any kind of uh, statute of limitations on the observations that you take? In other words, do you have a certain period of time between the time you observe and the time you say you complete a program and submit your paperwork? Not on the ones I'm familiar with. I do know uh, one requirement for the sketching program is when they develop that, which was around 2014, only maybe a year after I started serious observing, there were a number of people who had input to that that had been sketching for a long time. And they said, no, you can only use 10 observations from prior to 2014 for that particular program. Uh, 
I did mention that first solar system program. I submitted that, was totally honest on the time and place of those observations. Uh, my daughter's 33, 34 right now. Uh, that was third grade. That's plenty of years back. So uh, I haven't noticed any issues uh, with other statutes of limitations. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I'm looking on the chat and I don't think I see any questions. Uh, let me just make sure. Yeah. So if anybody does, oh, I'm sorry, here we got one. Uh, Hannah uh, Power, uh, if you would please come off mute and ask your question. Yes, hi, uh, I am a new member, um, so I haven't yet reached my two month member status, but once I do, I was wondering who do I reach out to if I'm interested in the telescope loaner program. Uh, that is a great question. Uh, there is a individual by the name of Harry Wright. That is uh, the coordinator for that. Um, and I'm trying to think. Uh, what his uh, email address is, I, I can't think of, I think right off the top of my head. If you go into the HAS website, you may see it there. Um, if you don't, I would say, if, if for some reason you're not able to locate Harry's information, I would send an email to info at, I think it's uh, astronomy houston.org and either joe or one of the one of the leadership team will pick that up and and be able to get uh, get you an answer to that perfect thank you you bet i will add that my understanding is that the club does have a hydrogen alpha scope such as the one i showed in one of the slides there for uh, observing solar prominences and features so that uh, should be available. Okay. Uh, Don, you had a question uh, about uh, binoculars. Did you mean to uh, ask that of Craig, or you were just sending out a query to the team or to the or to, uh, anybody on the call? I know that was Don Adams. Anybody? Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, just open it up to the floor. Does anybody have any questions for Craig before we conclude our program tonight? Going once, going twice, sold. All right, really good. Again, Craig, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. A lot of great information. Uh, a lot of good information about how to get started. So really appreciate that. Uh, remember tomorrow to dial in, we have a uh, uh, really good program or presentation from uh, Don Sully. He's going to be talking about using camera trackers for astro imaging. So please make sure uh, if you've got time to tune in for that. And with that, I want to wish you all a pleasant evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.